Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will now turn to a country which I am convinced, or a continent even, which I am convinced uh, will be a green hydrogen superpower uh, in the next decade. Uh, I was in spending a couple of weeks in India, two or three weeks back, and I think we came all back convinced that there is an enormous drive, enormous excitement, not just on green hydrogen, but in the entire renewable sector in India, which of course is the underpinning of potential green hydrogen in the future, uh, the, the solar and wind industry. There is so much excitement. There's a strong drive from the top political level, and there is a vibrant commercial business sector, and most, many of them are represented here, with this drive to, to execute uh, under the guidance or, or, or regulations which will be set by Prime Minister Modi and, uh, and the top leadership. But this combination of political leadership, very strong at the moment in India, with the vibrant business, that has proven itself to be the recipe for success. I mean, that's how Singapore, South Korea, China, so many other nations have developed, and I see exactly that happening in India at this moment. Strong government, strong private sector. We will explore a lot more here. I think Aron set us on the right uh, path yesterday when he said that uh, India is, I may not say wasting, but at least using $160 billion a year importing oil and gas. So if that can be replaced by using Indian resources like the wind or the solar or sun or the produ production of green hydrogen, it's a triple win. Creating jobs in India, making India energy independent, and of course doing good for Mother Earth and the, uh, and the environment at the same time. So that's what we will explore in this conversation. How can that happen in actual terms? And what are some of these amazing companies represented here uh, uh, doing at the moment? Let me very briefly introduce them, but we have the opportunity to introduce more uh, later. Uh, we have clo closest to me, we have Vinet Matal, is the chairman of the Avada Energy Group, which is a very, very strong uh, green energy company in India. Uh, we then have Sanmit Sam Ahudra, who is an expert member of the Clean Ganga, which is a mission set up by the Prime Minister to clean the mother of all rivers, the Ganga River. Uh, then we have Arun Sharma, who is advisor to the chairman uh, and the sustainability lead of the Adana Group, so now one of the biggest business groups in India. And then uh, finally, we have, uh, not finally, because we have two more, we have Vikram Kapoor, who is the President and Chief Growth Officer of Renew Power, another company I just visited in, in Noida outside Delhi. And finally, we have Simran Sinha, who is an analyst with the uh, Green Hydrogen uh, Organization. We, before we start, we will have a short video uh, by uh, Dr. Viba Davam, uh, and she's the Director of Terry, the Energy uh, uh, and uh, Energy and Research Institute, is it? I think so, yeah, Energy and Research Institute, which you may also connect um, with the, <coughs> the International Climate Panel and the, the Peace Prize, because of course the director of, the, of Terry was the person who led the, uh, the um, uh, International Panel for Climate Change for, for many years and received the Peace Prize uh, when, when that was handed out. But now, um, uh, Dr. Vibhadavam, please. Good morning, good evening to participants of Green Hydrogen Global Assembly and Exhibition. I would have loved to participate personally, but uh, I'm glad at least I'm able to participate virtually and giving the message from our end. If one has to know how dire the situation is, the statistics may put it in perspective. The atmospheric carbon dioxide in Earth now measures 419 parts per million, the highest it has been in over 4 million years. Energy-related carbon dioxide emissions accounts for two-thirds of global GHG emission. Now, more than ever, it is imperative to reduce carbon dioxide emissions if we have to meet our target of net zero by 2070. Mindful of this potential, Honorable Prime Minister of India launched the National Hydrogen Energy Mission with the objective of making the country self-sufficient in energy. 
at present, we import almost 40% of our energy demands. Moving towards a hydrogen economy can help us not only reduce our oil, natural gas, and coal imports, but it has potential of exporting hydrogen to other countries as well. So I can say that we have shown the feasibility of the technology, but reducing cost so that it can be used on a large scale is still awaited. The other problem with hydrogen, and it's not just green hydrogen, it's hydrogen created by any means, is the cost of CapEx, the infrastructure that you need to set up. It is cost associated with storage, transportation, handling, safety aspects, and so on. To make green hydrogen cost competitive, because the competition is with gray hydrogen, we need to produce production costs to a dollar to $1.5 max per kg of hydrogen. Maturation of these technologies and enhancing the operation scales will play a key role in making green hydrogen a reality. Further to tap hydrogen potential, its fast adaptation is essential at global level. To realize this, there is a need to accelerate the technology innovations. What we also require is R&D support. The, it's, as I said, it's proof of concept. To commercialize it, you have to make major breakthroughs. And that is the major gap for commercialization today. And really speaking, if we really want to move or rather we want to survive ourselves as human beings, it is important to take care of the planet, make these investments and move towards a net zero planet. And hydrogen, because it can be used in difficult to abate sectors like steel and cement, I think this investment is worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Viba Davan and Tero Kos is uh, a core institute in Delhi uh, for uh, maybe the lead Indian think tank uh, for, for the environment. So many years also led by Dr. Dr. Parshavri. But we are now moving on to the panel. We'll start with you, Arun. Uh, you spoke yesterday, but I think um, uh, you can repeat some of the core elements of that message. But I, I'm eager to have your, I mean, you have a long career in the United States, in Australia and in India. Professor Emeritus from the University of Queensland, but you are here mainly in the capacity of being advisor to the Adana Group, which is one of the lead Indian companies. What we're eager to understand, I think, is number one, why is the government and Vice Prime Minister Modi invested so much of his time uh, and energy in this? And what is the response by a big Indian group like uh, Adana? I mean, when Prime Minister Modi launched uh, uh, the uh, clean hundred, uh, green hydrogen emission, Mr. Adani, I mean, the day after, maybe the same day, put a, and a huge amount of money on the table for this mission. So please explain these dynamics between politics and business, how, how we expect that to work in the time to come. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, and first of all, thank you for being a friend of India uh, and showing such a great interest uh, and faith in the possibility of India. I think my colleagues um, and I heard we need this morning, uh, we all have been repeating the same message that something exciting is happening in India. And the excitement in India is actually based on some foundations. Um, and the foundations are very simple. India has been able to scale up solar and increasingly in wind in a very significant way. Uh, as this morning, we need uh, mentioned that uh, there was no lost decade after the global financial crisis in India so far as renewable energy is concerned. And so that is the foundation which gives you 65 to 70% of the cost of hydrogen that gives them the confidence that they can actually do it. Again, the number is very simple. Uh, it is about decarbonization, but that's a long-term goal, 2070. The bigger problem is energy independence, $160 billion a year in energy imports. And this is the golden ticket for the first time 
there is an indigenous source of energy that not only is going to save foreign exchange, but is also going to reduce air pollution when it replaces diesel. That in India is a much bigger problem than climate change currently is, and I'm sure in the long term, climate change will trump everything. But air pollution, the quality of air, the deaths that are preventable is a big public health crisis. And then India, of course, looks at it from the perspective of creating economic opportunity. Now, India has come up with a national hydrogen policy, a hydrogen mission. The prime minister did that uh, 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 last year. Uh, and, and it is now being supported by uh, policy initiatives. And the first cab of the rank was uh, the Ministry of Power with supply side incentives. Uh, and I think you did a great job of explaining uh, and both we need uh, at different audiences in terms of waiver of transmission and distribution charges, uh, making land renewable, ability to bank renewable energy for, for green ammonia and green hydrogen projects. Uh, and in some ways also production linked incentives <laughs> is being planned, which will allow India to build manufacturing capability for, for electrolyzers and fuel cell. But the more important thing that India is doing is coming up with mandates and demand mandates in green ammonia for the fertilizer industry and also for refining. And increasingly, it will come for green steel for export purposes and city gas distribution. But they're probably uh, uh, like, you know, the pace will, will be determined by the government. Now, the reason why this is going to be effective is uh, the point is very important. And that's the last point I'll make is that supply side incentives are very easy for governments. All they have to do is find some public finance and provide this stand in front of a gigafactory and get their pictures taken. It's the demand side incentives, which the corporate sector wants for predict predictability of offtake that is lacking because whenever you create a mandate, you are taking business away from others. And that is always politically a very challenging game. Where India benefits here in, is, a, is a blessing in disguise is it doesn't have a lot of natural gas. So it doesn't have to worry that much about displacing. What it is doing is it will be replacing green hydrogen in the long term by imported LNG, whose variability of cost price and the upstream emissions can also be significant. So that's why See, India always flatters to deceive, but we think this time that they have, they have the, the groundwork. They have learned their lesson in creating mandates. We all remember in India, the biofuel blending mandate didn't work because they, went too they were too ambitious. So I think, I think the ingredients are there uh, and my colleagues are like, you know, will we'll expand on this, um, but, but we are quite hopeful that India might surprise the rest of the world. Um, in, in the transition to the green hydrogen economy. Th th thank you so much, Arun. But since this is so, such a central part of the discussion, please tell us how will that mandate work in practi practical terms? How will the government set the mandate and how will it work for the business? So that's the million dollar question uh, because exactly how the offtake agreements will be announced, there will be an aggregation. Uh, the, some of the planning is around like, you know, the SECI, which does the solar aggregation mandates and the bits that is also being looked at. Uh, I think trying to sort of like, you know, double guess, some of my colleagues may have better knowledge about how they will work. I think the, the fundamentals are simple, okay? In refining, it's a no brainer. The cost of hydrogen compared to the end product is only two to 4%. So even if you put a more expensive green hydrogen for part of the, the thing, the cost to the end product is not going to be significant. In case of ammonia, for, say for ammonia, uh, 80 to 90% of the cost is actually green hydrogen. And here, again, a small mandate is likely to not be a severe impost on the final product, especially compared to the imports and import substitution. And so, so like, you know, I, my colleagues can pick that up, but, um, but trying to predict here what the government is doing is, is um, neither a good idea nor not very advisable. 
I, I find this personally very fascinating and interesting also from a political level, because I mean, India is now led by a party which historically was seen as a market oriented and right wing political party. But the policies applied are using the state as a main driver for private sector development uh, of, of, of the economy, which is exactly what many of us advocate also in Europe. We, ne we need to do that because the time of Reagan and Thatcher where everything can be left to the market is, is over. No one believes in that any longer. So it's very interesting to see uh, well, what, what's in every rubric in, in international newspapers called a right-wing party. <laughs> is applying a centrist or maybe even left-wing econom economic policy using use, using the state. You want to comment to that before I go to the next? I, I, I'm not going to comment to that, but what I can tell you that this whole myth about the market doing everything to do with innovation is, uh, is, is questionable anyway. The entire technology revolution in the United States was funded by public funds. The DARPA, the defense budget, different government agencies, what they did was undertake the long-term R&D and innovation. Even in biotech, the amount of funding that National Institutes of Health spends in building that pipe chain and where the private sector and where the venture capitalists come in is that last mile of the productization or taking an idea into service. So, so no country has built an entire innovation ecosystem without significant intervention and public funding. Market has a very important role, but that's in the last <clears throat> mile of the innovation relay. If you want to explain now, I'll give you the floor and then I'll go to the, next, to the other speakers, please. So if you look at the similar debate was happening when solar started, if uh, Indian government would have not given feed-in tariff and multilaterals like ADB, DG, FMO, Proparco, IFC would have not funded and uh, Indian banks would have not given that aid, the sector would be nowhere and we would be talking and debating. So what I see is that uh, you will see a lot of fancy presentation by global bank, but they are good in making presentation, but uh, the last one to come in emerging country and uh, put their money where their mouth is. So the what government is doing is uh, doing an amazing work. They understand business dynamics. Uh, they are uh, trying to resolve uh, issues which bankers will eventually face in funding these projects. So they are creating viable, sustainable marketplace. And in the process, uh, they are uh, using a highest level of transparency of uh, doing the reverse auction and discovering the most efficient uh, player to win. And uh, I think uh, that is the model. Uh, it should be uh, if world wants to achieve 100 million ton uh, hydrogen. I think that's the right model because what you are doing is uh, uh, disintermediating the risk. Like Germany did, uh, we had the speaker uh, before who said that he has got a $900 million grant uh, to buy the uh, green ammonia from the overseas market and supply it uh, uh, in the local market uh, and take that market risk. So basically it uh, disintermediates market risk and you are dealing with a sovereign uh, sponsored company. So the credit rating of off taker is very high and it becomes a bankable project. Otherwise, uh, most of the institution who comes uh, to these conferences, they will talk nicely and uh, and uh, million ton dream will remain million ton dreams. We had a very interesting conversation before we came here, which there are a couple of elements which really fascinated me. One of them was how early Prime Minister Modi was on this, because when he was chief minister in, in Gujarat, he, you can tell me, but in the audience said he encouraged you to start on solar. That was at a time where hardly any leader in the world believed solar could be anything of importance. It was a small, small thing in the outskirts, and he, he told you, please go on solar. Uh, and also that you're so much inspired by the old Indian, in, Indian philosophy and in your business model. So tell us a little bit more about your group, what, what you, how you will make this transition into green hydrogen, but also how it has evol evolved in the solar industry. Uh, uh, we are one of the oldest uh, solar company in India. It's a 12-year-old company. We, had, uh, we were lucky to 
set up first a large ground mounted uh, solar system of uh, 15 megawatt uh, long back and now uh, last month we have commissioned uh, the project which is 1250 uh, megawatt uh, which is one of the largest in the world and probably the largest operational solar project at a single location by a single developer i think india has a tremendous potential we are uh, is still the country where uh, 24 by 7, uh, 365 days power uh, to most of Indian is still uh, a dream. Uh, we still have uh, power cuts in remote area, though our grid connectivity has reached. So in India uh, is doing something uh, unique, uh, like uh, in telecom, what we did is uh, we didn't have landline to most of the houses and we directly went uh, wireless uh, with uh, 2G and now 4G and uh, we have uh, probably the largest internet user after China of 900 million people. And same thing is happening in the renewable space. Uh, what country did is uh, because of its uh, approach uh, to support the new sector, uh, it created a bankable industry uh, and uh, then drove the efficiency uh, and uh, brought the cost, uh, which is much lower than uh, conventional uh, power costs of either uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, hydro uh, thermal or even cheaper than nuclear. So solar is the cheapest uh, source of energy in India. And it's uh, what they have done uniquely also using solar to bring uh, farmers on the grid in the daytime. And earlier our country used to supply the farmers uh, power in the nighttime. And there was a lot of wastage of groundwater as well as uh, energy wastage. So we are uh, using uh, entire renewable to solve a lot of the problem. And now what is happening is uh, like Mr. Sharma was saying yesterday uh, that 2047 is a unique year uh, for us, 100 year of independence. And India definitely want to become independent of uh, our imports uh, of oil and gas. Currently a large uh, portion of our foreign exchange goes uh, into paying for these oil imports and uh, hydrogen is the new oil and India is among a few country which understood it uh, early on. It's uh, created a policy which is uh, very good. It's a first phase of policies already announced and the second phase where they will mandate uh, hydrogen purchase obligation and similar thing they had done renewable is expected in next few months. And once that is out, I think uh, it will be policy worth studying by global uh, uh, governments uh, to emulate and implement because that way what you are doing is uh, uh, you are kind of uh, taking it from the incubation stage to the practical stage at a very fast pace. And that will also inspire companies like Arcelor and few others who have recently in entered India to move into the green, uh, green steel space and a uh, lot of hard to abate sector like green uh, uh, you are talking about steel, ammonia, aluminium, cement, and many others where uh, uh, there was always a debate that it's a part of process and you can't change it and it can't be made green. Now India will probably set up a very ambitious target and uh, preliminary meeting which we had with Niti Aayog, they, they have a target to convert uh, the entire fertilizer sector uh, uh, by 2035 on the green uh, ammonia base. And if that has to happen, uh, we are looking at a measurable, repeatable and definable goal. So what I find uh, unique about India is uh, our prime minister always talks about uh, Vasudev Kutumbakam. So when you ask him uh, what it means uh, to him, it's basically the whole world is one family. So when uh, we at India control our uh, pollution, it's not only helping our own citizen, but it's helping uh, the whole world and universe. And in uh, our Vedic literature and uh, the philosophy which we follow in India, we actually uh, treat uh, earth as mother. Uh, and like uh, Eric was saying, uh, Ganga is our uh, uh, favorite uh, river and we treat it as a mother. We consider a banyan tree as a 10, uh, equivalent to 10 sons and daughters, and uh, we worship every morning uh, sun as a god. And uh, wind is uh, actually our uh, uh, Lord Hanuman uh, father is a wind god. So it's actually 
uh, for us, uh, divinity lies in the natural uh, uh, things and nature. So uh, the philosophy which we are taught as a part of religion is that uh, what you have uh, inherited from your forefathers, you have no right to spoil it and uh, give to your next generation uh, a place uh, which is not worth living. So I think a lot of uh, our policy and uh, entrepreneurs who have entered this sector, they have not just entered into this sector because this is uh, going to make them billions, but they have entered entered in this sector because your source of wealth becomes pure. There cannot be uh, any other business where you are using abundance of water, abundance of sun, and abundance of wind to convert, uh, to solve. Like when I say now, I tell my kids that um, uh, we'll be using water to drive the car. And it sounds funny, but that's what hydrogen eventually will do. Maybe Elon Musk will not make those cars but there will be some other entrepreneurs who will believe in that and uh, e-mobility with the uh, hydrogen would become real. So for India, I think uh, it's not only about uh, energy transition, it's about uh, what we believe is strongly. It's part of our cultural uh, and uh, value system that uh, we respect nature. And uh, now we are realizing we have abused it a lot. And uh, the time is that we might be promising net zero by 2017, but the way our government is working and the ecosystem they are creating, I think they are very serious that by 2047, India should uh, uh, move to the greener economy. Thank you. Th th thank you so much, Vinita. I really love hearing you connecting the old Indian tradition with business of today and doing business, yes, to make money and create jobs, but also for a purpose. Uh, to make the, the life for people better, to make the planet a better place. That's exactly the business we need, purpose-driven business. So, thank you. Uh, we will then move on to Simran Sinha. Uh, Simran uh, has been one of the persons really making sure that this conference was a success. Her hidden hand has been everywhere, uh, making us, uh, making all the practical arrangements, but She's also a student at the New Delhi University, and she has spent a lot of time following Indian green, green policies. So we're eager to have your understanding of what's, what's happening in India now, particularly on the green hydrogen front. Thank you, Eric. So to start with, I'm actually honored to be on this panel with this lineup. And I, I'm actually here representing like a lot of things. So first and foremost, I represent my organization, the Green Hydrogen Organization. I also represent the youth for green hydrogen and like women in green hydrogen. And as you would have seen in this panel, like we do not unfortunately could have like somebody from the government come up to say about the policy. So I kind of being an Indian took that opportunity to have a recap of what the Indian national uh, hydrogen strategy that was recently released is. So yeah, I will quickly catch up everybody in this room and watching online on what the Indian national hydrogen strategy is. So the policy was released in February this year by the Ministry of Power, New and Renewable Energy. And it is targeted to make India a hub for green hydrogen and green ammonia production by 2030 to reduce its dependence on fossil fuels and to scale up its already existing target of renewable capacity of 500 gigawatts. So I have been working on anal analyzing a few national strategies with the Green Hydrogen Organization, and I'm sure everybody in this room uh, must have seen all the totems that we've put up on the expo. So I've been working on analyzing all these uh, strategies for somehow like some somewhere around 17 countries. And we can say that soon the Green Hydrogen Organization will have a country portal on our website, hopefully by the next week. So we are very happy about that. So what I realize is different uh, with this Indian one is its sprint towards the usage of how it, the low cost renewable experience in India for green hydrogen. So it is in stark contrast, according to me, correct me if I'm wrong here, it is in stark contrast to some of the EU's plan that requires all green hydrogen production to come from new purpose built renewable facilities. So here India is not limiting where the clean electricity is for green hydrogen is actually coming from. The initial measure in the strategy facilitates access to renewable energy for hydrogen producers, as Mr. Sharma mentioned, 
by waving off the interstate transmission charges to green hydrogen and ammonia producers. It offers liberty to set up cap capacity for green hydrogen from the power exchange or set up re new renewable energy capacity themselves or through any other develop developer anywhere in India. It is important to note here that power cost somewhere accounts for one by fourth of the cost for green hydrogen. So this it, it's expected to bring down the cost of green hydrogen production by close to 40 to 50%. And that's the target in India to have uh, the cost of green hydrogen come down to, as Vibhadavan mentioned in the video, dollar one to 1 1.5 by 2030 per kg of green hydrogen production. The other key strategy that is there is banking of renewable energy. So this is allowed for a period of 30 days for the energy that will be going on to make green hydrogen. So renewable energy producers will be able to deposit the surplus power into the grid and withdraw it later for the use of green hydrogen. Another key issue currently that this policy is kind of addressing and is also helping India to build a large domestic market is that at this moment, there's only a handful of uh, states in India where you have renewables, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Rajasthan. So these policies are kind of an, in, it's kind of incentivizing investment for green hydrogen production facilities, even in states like, say, for example, I come from Bihar. So in Bihar, even in states with relatively lower renewable potential capacity. So yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a key policy that is, it's, it's removing some of the hurdles that are already there. We are working on the domestic market. We have we are working with the Ministry of Ports to develop storage facilities at the ports so, so that we can also become a global export hub. So that's all that I have to add to the panel for India's national hydrogen strategy. Thank you. Th th thank you so much. And I think it's very interesting the point, you are pointing to the differences between the EU and the, the Indian strategy. Maybe in the Indian strategy is more flexible and will work better in, in the in the long longer longer run. But, but but let's see. I mean, when you have different strategies, you will also have the opportunity to compare uh, the results of them. Uh, but uh, that, that's uh, I can, uh, it's for the future to decide. But I, I personally believe the Indian strategy may, may be more flexible and, and more workable. But let, let's see. We we'll then move on to uh, another company called Renew. Uh, Vikram Kapoor, you are the President and Chief Growth Officer of Renew. You may ask why you need a growth officer in a company which is growing, which is growing, <laughs> growing so fast. <laughs> you are a relatively new company and uh, uh, already a central player in the solar and, and wind industry in India, and I'm for sure also will be in the green hydrogen in, in the future. So um, your, your perspectives on future growth, please. Absolutely. You know, and that's a fabulous question. Why do you need a Chief Growth Officer in a company which is already growing that fast? The rationale there was to grow it beyond the IPP businesses into businesses like green hydrogen. So my mandate is uh, to build the green hydrogen business for Renew Power and to take Renew Power International. We are currently uh, very India focused. Uh, just a 30 second on uh, what Renew Power is. Uh, uh, Renew Power got started about uh, 11, 12 years back. And uh, today we have uh, a portfolio of about 12 gigawatts uh, of assets, 50% uh, solar, 50% wind. Uh, eight of which is operational and four of which is tied up with the uh, PPAs. Uh, going forward, we expect to execute uh, anywhere between three to five gigawatts of uh, uh, renewable capacity uh, per year, uh, all the way up to 2025 to get to about 2022 uh, gigawatt scale, right? Uh, <clears throat> now, I think uh, my colleagues have al already covered the macro of uh, of uh, of the situation in India, uh, uh, you know. So I'll not repeat that. I'll, I'll just I'll just uh, you know uh, underscore two specific points. Right for green hydrogen, you need a green electron, for which you need substantial amount of uh, renewable energy, as we can all imagine. Right now, uh, the country in my mind which will win is the country who's able to execute at scale, maybe 30, 40, 50 gigawatts of uh, net new renewable addition every year. Right. And for that to happen, uh, you know, the countries need to invest in the back end. Right. The world has dependent has depended upon on things like uh, uh, PV panels on China for a long time. I think uh, so. One of the policies which did not get talked about in the previous converse in the in the in the earlier part of this panel is uh, the, the thrust that the Indian government is putting 
on indigenizing manufacturing of solar uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, panels, right? Uh, the government has allocated almost two and a half billion dollars of uh, production linked incentives. And that will enable a uh, company like ours uh, to set up our own manufacturing facility, right? So we are in the process of setting up a manufacturing facility, which could churn out almost five gigawatts worth of uh, solar uh, panels every year, uh, getting operational uh, first quarter next year, right? So I think that will be a big enabler uh, because without that, uh, without that, uh, there is there is no green energy and then there is no green hydrogen, right? So I think the second thing, uh, that uh, I think the government is also leading from the front in the sense that uh, one of the largest uh, oil refiners in the country, uh, it's a public sector company called IOCL. Uh, you know, we have just recently got into a joint venture with them uh, where uh, uh, they are the big off takers and we are the sort of the providers of, uh, of green, uh, green, uh, green energy. Right. So I think that that combination of, of, of putting the demand and the supply under the same joint venture umbrella, I think is a again a very unique model uh, that's being tried out in India. It's a unique public-private partnership, and I'm 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 glad to say that uh, Renew Power has sort of a uh, little bit uh, shown the template on that, uh, both in India and potentially I don't know uh, potentially also globally, right? Um, the last thing I would say is that uh, you know the the one part of the puzzle which is uh, which is uh, uh, which definitely needs to come together to make some of these projects bankable is uh, on the purchase side. Um, it, it was briefly touched upon, but how do we get a PPP, PPPA, uh, PPA equivalent in uh, green hydrogen uh, going, right? And uh, I know there is a 10-year option out there, but I think uh, what, what at least our sense is it will need a 15, 20-year offtake agreement. Uh, for that kind of a large scale investment, right, uh, to a 100 million uh, mission that the GH2 organization has been pursuing, uh, for that to become a reality, right. So those will be some of the some of the uh, points that I would uh, I would say sort of reflects upon what uh, what our company is doing. Let 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 me fix uh, the uh, in in just one moment on what you said about investing outside. India, because India is now turning very fast into solar and all renewables. But one, what India is not at this point is a major exporter or a major international investor. It's mainly focused on, on the Indian market. China is totally dominating basically every environment market in the world. I mean, that's not no criticism of China. That's to their credit. But 80 percent of all solar panels are made there. Last year, 80 percent of all new hydropower was made in China. They're dominating in electric buses, uh, electric vehicles in, in so, so many other markets. But the only place I can see who over time could potentially compete with China is India. Because still salaries are substantially lower in India than in China. Uh, and you have a, a, a effective business sector. So can we, if you take a 10-year horizon, can we think of India being also a major exporter, a major, major competitor to China on the global markets? in the green sectors without doubt uh Eric, but without doubt i think this is uh, <clears throat> this has been uh, the calling of uh, the present government uh, ever since they uh, took office uh, they call it uh, atmanirbhar bharat uh, make in india campaign multiple uh, versions of it basically uh, <clears throat> you know and uh, the, the the scheme that i mentioned the, they, we call it in india the pli scheme production linked incentive scheme uh it, uh, it has benefited multiple sectors, and now it's being diverted to green sectors. I talked about uh, the solar panel PLI scheme. There's an equivalent scheme uh, uh, for electrolyzer manufacturing, uh, which will come, which are sort of, I would say, the two, two biggest uh, components or ingredients of, uh, of uh, where uh, sort of uh, China dominates, right? So uh, the, the, the third thing that I think the country uh, has, which is uh, worthy of, being exported is, you know, just the execution capacity at scale, right? Uh, you know, we've uh, there are many Indian uh, ENC companies who have been operating very successfully globally, uh, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and African geographies, etc. A lot of these geographies are also where a lot of production capacity for uh, uh, for green hydrogen is going to show up, right? Uh, so, um, uh, you know, so I think that's another 
if i may use the word form of export uh, that the country could uh, the country could do uh, to sort of enable uh, this uh, whole green uh, green transition right so just to answer your question i think i am convinced that uh, uh, india will definitely uh, be a very very front and center competitor to china uh, in in many of these uh, elements very interesting and i think i mean india has an enormous advantage in in the the size of the whole market that's of course an advantage also for china but when when i speak to you and I ask are you a gujarat company or are you a uh, haryana company you will always say no no we are all all over india there, there are very few companies are all over europe in the same sense because of language and many other many other historical cultural reasons but the enormity of the indian market and the ability of the big companies of india to invest basically everywhere in india gives a advantage at scale compared to European and American competitors. Not to, it's not, not compared to China, but compared to every other nation in the world. Do you agree? No, I would agree. I think, uh, uh, you know, I would just uh, uh, sort of say that, uh, look, I think we all know how the geopolitical situation across uh, multiple uh, pockets in the world is evolving, right? And uh, uh, you know, every country would uh, have to play to its strength. And clearly, India has recognized that manufacturing is one area where uh, we have historically not been uh, up to the mark. And we need to make up that distance. And it also happens at a time when the world is looking at a China plus uh, or alternate to China option, right? So, so, so yes. <clears throat> the, the last speaker is uh, Sanmit Ahudra, uh, who has... Uh, I think one of the most exciting of all determinations in India at the moment to clean River Ganga, to clean Mother Ganga, to clean, clean the most holy, maybe the most important river in the world. I have a long background from different, different um, academic and, and government and, and business work, but now, now this is one of your main, main activities. So please tell us about the, the Clean Ganga mission, but also have you uh, uh, how you see green hydrogen and, and, and renewables being part of this mission to clean River Ganga? Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, uh, I'll, I'll focus most of my talk on, on financing and, and demand side. Uh, I think we've covered to death the supply side and, and, and those issues. Uh, but very briefly, I, I'm Sanmit Ahuja. I sit on uh, the board of a government's think tank on, on the clean Ganga. Um, uh, just to give you the context, the river basin or the catchment is a quarter of India's landmass, uh, 1,000 square kilometer wide. 47% uh, of India's population lives in that river basin. So the authority is responsible for providing clean water and sustainable development to 600 million people. I, that's that's the catchment that that we are focusing on, and to Arun's comment on that financing of large programs or innovation was done by DARPA or wars as as we know in the past. Um, the Prime Minister took a very very clear view that programs of this size and scale have to be our moonshots. Right, so so we we use the program as a magnet for technology innovation, and in, I say innovation in a very broad context. It's not just technology; the tech works. Uh, we have enough faith in in the engineers. It's it's developing the right business, commercial, economic economic models. So uh, why is why is Ganga and hydrogen? How is that they're linked? Um, a lot of people would not know. Two thirds of cost of water in any form, drinking water treatment, supply, transport, storage. Two thirds of that cost is electricity. Right? And and uh, if we don't decarbonize, so India will spend at least in the Ganga basin alone. 100 billion plus in the next decade. If we don't take this opportunity to decarbonize this sector, we've missed a, missed a big opportunity. So, um, so we took a concerted effort now starting looking at how do we decarbonize. The, the lowest hanging fruits, of course, are looking at energy efficiency, looking at uh, water losses, looking at um, how, do we, how do we use uh, river systems as uh, carbon sinks and so those are the low hanging fruits and that's going on sadly a lot of people know of cop 26 and 27 not many people know there's a parallel cop running on biodiversity uh, cop 15 16 and, and 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 so on and so forth so um, india will play a quite a major role in biodiversity conservation but interestingly 
um, we know that some measures say three to 5% of India's electricity, and that, that's true for most countries, is consumed by the water sector. So uh, very interesting innovations coming through that to use uh, electrolysis in wastewater treatment plants. Um, you need water to, to electrolyze. Uh, when you electrolyze, you of course get hydrogen, but you also get oxygen. Right? No one's talking of oxygen. Oxygen is a very, very big component in the water sector. If I have more oxygen in, in the water treatment, my bacteria settles faster. And as a result, the water will be treated much quicker, which means I'll consume less power. So, so there's your business case right there. And then which brings to the point of sector coupling, that how do you create demand and how do you create the right business and economic cases? So if you start using producing uh, hydrogen from wastewater systems, I know Australia has done it, UK has done it, in India we're trialing it out. Um, you, you not only have hydrogen being consumed in the water treatment plants to displace diesel or even base load power, but also oxygen, and that creates the, the right economic uh, framework. Moving swiftly on, on the, on the financing side, um, the three innovations that we are extremely uh, proud of um, uh, Andrew mentioned uh, government subsidy. Government subsidy does not always have to be in form of cash. Uh, developing markets will have peculiar issues that there's paucity of cash. Do you provide subsidy for food to people or do you provide subsidy for, for new sectors? That, that, that fight is, is, is very clear and we know who's gonna win. So, so we using government's balance sheet essentially to, to in, attract more capital and lower the cost of capital. So firstly, we're creating gigawatt scale hydrogen capacity in, an, in, in a distributed decentralized way. We are aggregating that decentralized capacity, but linking it to global capital markets. So we've, we've now in partnership with pretty much all the stock exchanges in the world. Um, in the previous panel, I mentioned that <coughs> most funds and institutional investors do not or cannot invest outside OECD countries. So, so if we have listed vehicles on, on London Stock Exchange, on Frankfurt, on Tokyo, on NASDAQ and Singapore, we are able to tap into the trillions of dollars of ESG money and then bring that into, into the Indian market. So how are we doing that? Um, <clears throat> creating special purpose vehicles with a government guarantee wrapper around it and then, then listing that vehicle on, on, on the stock exchange. Now, what does that do to, to the economics of the sector. If I shift the capex of, of an electrolyzer from a private sector to now uh, either a government owned or pension fund owned, the IRR requirement for that electrolyzer in the private sector in rupee terms is 15, 16% equity IRR, but owned by pension fund, as, as you would know, uh, comes straight down to eight or 9% IRR. So I shave off that demand, that, that, that cost of capital significantly. Yesterday, IFC mentioned that they'll, they'll put money behind electrolyzers if you can bring them down to $800. Uh, so this, we've done all calculations. The $1,000 electrolyzers will come down to 600, 700. Now you're within a spitting distance of, of making the, the electrolyzers bankable. So listing, listing uh, instruments uh, or listed instruments on international stock exchange is one. Second, uh, there's a lot of renewable energy capacity that's either curtailed or suboptimal. So we are creating array of uh, electrolyzers, which would be uh, uh, built on what we call capacity leasing model. So smaller uh, renewable energy companies don't have to invest in CapEx. They can just lease out the electrolyzer uh, capacity. And, and this creates a significant jumpstart uh, on, on, on the hydrogen sector. And finally, the, uh, the point that, that you mentioned on, we need a trading instrument, trading vehicle. So much like a power trading corporation, which SECI does or NTPC does, uh, there's now already uh, talks and then we're leading on that framework development of a hydrogen trading corporation, where, which takes out the demand side risk and, and the volatility in the earlier stages of, of the market development. So these are three big financial innovations that we are completely very, very proud of. And, and finally, on, on the sector coupling side, demand side, um, there's significant use cases. I mentioned water as one, the municipality sector is another one. 
if you start displacing diesel in dumper trucks, in the buses, using uh, the waste to generate hydrogen, we've already doing two, three trial product uh, technology trials. We already partnered with a major aviation company to use uh, <coughs> hydrogen powered point-to-point uh, -point communication, uh, aircraft transportation, railways, mining sector, uh, all of these sectors are now starting to use uh, hydrogen powered uh, vehicles. Um, enough has been talked about the agriculture, particularly the fertilizer and, and, and ammonia. India is one of the largest importers of, of uh, fertilizer and ammonia. And I think that's gonna be a significant uh, impact that we'll have on the, uh, on, on, on the green hydrogen side. And, and, and finally, I think the big bang for the buck we'll get is on the rural development side. Two thirds of India's economy lives in its rural areas. They live in energy poverty at the moment. If we've not even factored in Africa, LATAMs, India's urbanization drive, if all of the people start to move towards cities or start to develop, God save this earth. It's it, it's going to be a very very difficult uh, problem to 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 handle. So we need to bring jobs into the rural areas, and for that we need to have hydrogen. Uh, in, in play. And I think that's a fantastic uh, opportunity that, that we are working on and developing what we call model hydrogen powered villages is, is one such pilot program. So we're running a dozen of pilots. Technology is just one, one element, but how do you bring the right economic and financial structures on it is, is I think the key. And uh, very much uh, uh, look forward to partnering with as many of you uh, come to India and use that as a, as a, as a playground. So final point is uh, I think the ingredients are all there. We just need different master chefs to, to create the right dish. So we need hydrogen focused master chefs. So that's my few cents. Th th thank you so much, Sumit. This was, uh, this was excellent. And I think you made a very important point that innovation is not just about the technical innovation. It's also about the society innovation, how, how you structure society in such a way that, that you can get, get a lot more done. We will now uh, give the floor to Aaron, but while you're speaking, if anyone in the, uh, in the audience want to post some question or make some comment, uh, please feel free to raise your hands. But Aaron, you wanted to react. So I just wanted to bring one point close to the green hydrogen uh, standard. Um, it's a technical point, but it's, I think, quite useful. Uh, the green hydrogen standard, actually a great initiative. We need that. Um, I, a kilogram of carbon dioxide emitted per kilogram of hydrogen is a good way to sort of look at this. Now, the definition of green hydrogen in the Indian policy and the green hydrogen standard, there's a slight difference. India allows the steam methane reformation of biomass to be called green hydrogen. And we have to do the calculations to figure out whether it will be limited to one kilogram, probably not. But I think the more important question here, and I think green hydrogen standard can also accommodate it because there are broader social benefits. Um, you, Sumit, you also mentioned about the, the rural development. The biggest challenge facing India is the migration from rural areas to the cities. Now, biomass, high levels of utilization of biomass is the only thing that can create manufacturing jobs in rural India, because the economics of moving biomass to cities does not work. The density of biomass is like, you know, very low. So the moment you are able to aggregate the biomass, either you use biorefining to produce high value added chemicals or use steam methane reformation to produce hydrogen, which Indian government includes that in the definition of green hydrogen, you're creating local jobs and, and supporting the local economies. And I think we should have a discussion on the green hydrogen standard that in case you're using biomass, if you're able to demonstrate the rural benefits that come out of it in terms of prosperity, then it will be sort of like, you know, accepted. So I think it's something for us to discuss. Um, and just picking up a uh, point um, from Vikram, I think he's absolutely right. The Indian government has got a policy to not only make India self in, like, you know, uh, independent in terms of manufacturing supply chains, but also to become a global supply chain uh, provider. 
Uh, contrary to popular opinion, India actually has excelled in certain areas of manufacturing. So far as auto parts are concerned, it is actually an advanced manufacturing hub. And so that skill set is there. You know, we are in the process of completing, uh, increasing our solar panels, totally indigenizing it from 1.2 gigawatt to 3 gigawatt already. Uh, we are actually now going to be building a 5 uh, megawatt uh, uh, onshore uh, wind turbine uh, in partnership with a German technology firm. So we, we are beginning to do that. And I think it's a good thing for the world to have a diversity of supply chains from low wage economies. And I think the world will benefit if eventually Africa and Latin America also create those hubs, because we will never then have the kind of crisis that we have seen in recent years. And ultimately, if everyone is able to bring down the cost of the input to the green hydrogen, the transition will take place uh, much faster. Thank you. Um, any question, please, over there? Thank you. Can you for sure get one of these mics? Thank you. So, my name is Ralph Berndt. Um, it's just with uh, Dr. Rune and one panel, of course, the idea of making the biomethane now uh, green, I don't think fits into European de definition, but is, of course, a huge point to consider to ensure that the standards are globally acceptable and not dictated by developed onto developing economies. So it's a good point to take further. And I definitely appreciate also from some of the ideas on financing, which are really exciting. That is the problem for, for many countries is that the, as the investment cost is so high initially, the aggregation, which allows smaller companies to come in and also allows also for more decentralized production. As a great ideas, thank you. Hope to learn more and more contact. I had two questions or two suggestions, two ideas. One, it is um, the um, Vikram talked about the idea of 10 to 15, uh, 15 to 20 year uh, price contracts. The question is more of a like in more of an idea suggestion. If uh, the Russian German model of the initial gas contracts in the 1960s, uh, 60s or 70s was ever explored which would probably, I think they even provided 20 to 30 year gas contract prices. Because the challenge that you have is how do you invest knowing that you have very long recovery times and where you want to have really at least fixed prices. So that might be an idea just to explore. And the second idea, the question is more, um, India has uh, again, really um, fantastic, done a great job with 150 gigawatts of power. I think Germany even only has 90. Um, the, the, uh, the target is 500 by 2030. Uh, as we've just been discussing these past one and a half days, renewable power is the prerequisite for green hydrogen. So how realistic is the goal of 500 gigawatt by 2030? Thank you. Vikram, you, you will provide the 500. So look, uh, I think the 500 target will definitely be challenging. Uh, if I add on top of 500 of renewable, uh, the equivalent amount that would, uh, you know, I, I would need to add another 100 gigawatts for the green hydrogen commitment that or the target that the government has set. So we would actually need to install between now and 2030 in India, uh, roughly 500 gigawatts of additional capacity, which means in about eight years, 60 gigawatts per, per year. Right? We today do about 15 to 20. So, I mean, just to put the scale of the challenge in place, we, we have to triple it. So short answer is it's, it's not going to be easy. Uh, uh, I personally feel that I think India can scale up to a 35 to 40 gigawatt per annum uh, in the next uh, two to three years. Uh, but whether we will be able to go beyond that, maybe potentially uh, so, but at least I see a line of sight to 35 to 40 gigawatts per annum for sure, which will take us to maybe about 450, 500. I don't know about 600. I, like, you know, I think, I think none of these targets are easy to achieve, but I think India has demonstrated a pace and a commitment 
that it can deliver. And there is a mood in the nation that this is India's moment. For the first time, there is an energy resource that is totally indigenous. And it's like a game where you have suddenly sensed an opening. So I think that that factor of the emotional momentum uh, coupled with business reality, I think is going to play a role. Let me just touch upon one last point why it, it, it can actually deliver is if you look at whether it is Adani Group or it is Renew Power or Reliance, all the, all the projections that have come up in terms of investment and scale, then it definitely is achievable if all of these companies are actually able to achieve their, their target. This is where the point that Vikram made is India has demonstrated execution capability and it will execute projects globally, but also in India. And suddenly it will find that there is a dimension of green ammonia in exports that will drive the commercial viability of additional capacity that, that we are likely to see. Right now we are projecting it in terms of what the Indian government's 5 million tons of uh, uh, green hydrogen, uh, like, you know, uh, target by 2030 is. But as the execution capability and the cost of electrolyzers are indigenized, uh, you are likely to see an export market. And, uh, and, uh, and that's where India might surprise us. So, Mehit, Vinit, you want to comment, please? I, I think, uh, like uh, uh, many countries, uh, we do have uh, sufficient land. Our Thar Desert alone is uh, 200,000 square kilometer. And, uh, and say, if we have to implement uh, uh, 40 odd gigawatt, you require around uh, four size, uh, four times size of Barcelona. So that is doable. Uh, but so far we have succeeded in that model because uh, government uh, used to make a large solar park and provide uh, transmission and land uh, at a convenience of uh, developer. So that will be a bottleneck, but I, I would not be surprised if government continues to do that and uh, helps uh, to meet the target. But I think uh, now the market dynamics uh, are uh, changing. Uh, there is a huge uh, supply side constraint. Uh, last uh, 12 years, we have worked under the uh, surplus supply chain. So I think globally, uh, there would be challenges. Uh, because there are not uh, going to be sufficient number of uh, uh, solar panels uh, to uh, balance of system to wind machines uh, because uh, overall globally every country has revised their target uh, many fold even EU's target today looks very impressive uh, but uh, India has still a hope because uh, like uh, uh, our colleagues were saying uh, government is coming out with new scheme to support uh, electrolyzers. We will get a $2 billion subsidy for the industry to manufacture electrolyzer locally. We are getting subsidy to manufacture uh, panels locally. So I think uh, government is uh, aligning with the industrial need and seeing the challenge area and proactively addressing those challenges. Uh, so I'm quite optimistic and uh, time will only tell uh, if government addresses uh, most of the issues or uh, some of the issues uh, leads us not to succeed on those targets. But unless you have a lofty target, you have not much to dream for. So, so I would say I would rather have an amazing target and work towards achieving them than having a ridiculously low target and exceed it and, uh, and then feel happy about it. So, Matt, if India shall triple uh, its production in, in a few years' time, what, where should it focus? What, what are the main constraints to be overcome to achieve such a high target? I, I think the, whilst there are global supply chain issues, but I think one of the critical barriers was uh, lack of long-term finance. Right? Companies with large balance sheets were able to tap into that finance, but vast majority of the SME and small and medium in Indian renewable means a gigawatt, right? 
uh, that's 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 still a very very large company. There's at least four thousand megawatts of capacity right now stuck in the SME sector, which is not able to roll over. Which means typically they would have gotten private equity funding, or they would have listed or sold their assets um, to to generate more more capital or recycle the capital. That is not happening with these SMEs. Uh, I think that model has has changed dramatically in the last three or four years. Uh, infrastructure asset globally are funded or owned by pension funds, insurance funds. Now, there wasn't pension funds and insurance funds will not take development risk, construction risk. They only want operational assets. But again, currency as a risk was, uh, was a big barrier. So as I said, once we list these instruments, these vehicles on international markets, uh, and that started to happen, uh, you will see significant capital coming in and, and as the SME sector, even the larger corporates start to flip their assets over to the pension funds, the amount of capital availability just, just you know, increases significantly. So that is, I think, a critical, critical barrier that India has now overcome. And, and what was, we were able to deliver 10, 15 gigawatts with financing constraints. Now with no financing constraints, that number will triple easily. So that's, that's my, my suggestion. <coughs> Other questions from the audience? Simran, do you want to comment? No? Please feel free. Please over there. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Well, my question is more addressed to the political domain of uh, in India, especially because we have insisted on the fact of how uh, Modi's government is trying to subsidize in the correct way both the demand and the supply side of uh, the hydrogen and the green uh, transformation. But I was wondering whether uh, Modi's policies that could be regarded as sectarian somehow may impact the future of business, the business trajectory also for green hydrogen, how like the alienation of a sector of the society may impact on future possibilities in India? Uh, actually, if you look at uh, in India across the political spectrum, uh, everyone agrees uh, with uh, Prime Minister Modi that green is the way to go. And it's not only because they have converted green, because that's most profitable and the lowest cost. Uh, so this uh, policy, uh, once government uh, announces and signs any agreement under that, that is uh, applicable uh, whether government changes or government uh, does not change. And uh, there are many uh, highest court verdict by Supreme Court where someone tried to challenge uh, the agreement which was signed in the previous regime and uh, new government came and they tried to renegotiate. And court have taken a very strong view of that and ensured that uh, what was signed is being honored. So uh, India doesn't uh, just uh, have a political parties. We have a very strong uh, and vibrant democracy and uh, legal framework, which ensures uh, consistency of policy and uh, contracts, which are honored and uh, uh, honored across uh, the politi political spectrum. So if you look at it, India has signaled a target, net zero target of 2070. Now, as part of the global rules-based order, that's the time, time is clicking. Now, India has a challenge. India does not have natural gas. Natural gas as a source of power in India is not possible simply because it's unaffordable. If Europe finds it difficult when the price goes up, can you imagine India where the actual actual income levels are 110 to 120th uh, in terms of European levels. So India, as you know, a lot of the base load comes from coal and it has to find a transition away from coal. So no matter how you look at it, the transition away from coal is going to depend on green hydrogen. As soon as the price of green hydrogen comes down to 80 US cents a kilogram. With the price curve for combined cycle gas turbines, you have load following and base load power 
from green hydrogen. And that's the simple equation. Until then, let us figure out how we can use green hydrogen, green ammonia, blend it, reduce the emissions of Indian thermal power plants, but keep investing in reducing the price of green hydrogen to under a dollar. And at 80 cents, I think India on the current trajectory uh, by 2035 or slightly after that will be able to do that. Many developed economies are finding it very difficult to get out of coal and natural gas. We heard all the arguments today, and I think we have to balance that. Green hydrogen is the last mile for decarbonization of almost any sector. And there is a national consensus, as we need said, and there is a rules-based order where India has signed up to a 2070 net zero target. Um, so I think the rest of the world can, can, um, can rest assured. Uh, and India also has a very activist judiciary, as Vineet said. So if political parties try to do things differently, the judiciary does uh, come into play. If you allow me one comment as, as a foreigner observing India from, from outside, I mean, I think uh, Prime Minister Modi has completely transformed the Indian debate in one very important area. And that is the, the old debate in India was, do we want to develop or do we want to take care of the environment and Mother Earth? And then surprisingly, 95 or 98 percent of Indians wanted to develop. And I, I still recall when Indian negotiators came back from the climate talks, they were nearly always accused of, of sellout. They sold out Indian interest to foreign, basically meaning to Europe and North America. Completely gone. The new debate is how can India develop and go green exactly at the same time? Of course, based on solar and green hydrogen and wind and all these technologies is possible. That is also a transformation of the uh, debate from the win-lose debate of the past into the win-win uh, opportunity of the 21st century. And I give a lot of credit to Narendra Modi for, I mean, it helped by the economics of solar and new technologies, but he has also transformed the debate. But interestingly, now you see many of the states, also states which are not dominated by the BJP, the ruling party, making huge uh, progress. State of Maharashtra, which is run by the opposition, uh, uh, leading India on electric vehicles. State of Telangana, which is also somewhat in opposition, is a leader on green, uh, greening of the land and tree planting. State of Andhra Pradesh, a leader on green agriculture. Uh, state of Tamil Nadu are leading many areas, so, solar one of them. Again, all these states are, are run by parties which are not linked to the BJP. So it's, yes, a leadership from the prime minister, but also a much, much bigger move in the Indian political um, uh, environment as I can see it, which is of course good for the future. More questions? Any final comment from the panel? Okay. Okay, we end on this lucky note. There is a lot of progress uh, in India. Uh, Indian uh, political leadership and the Indian business sector is now moving very, very fast. Uh, the ambitions are high, uh, but I think we will see ma massive, major uh, positive developments in India. In the, in, the, in, the, in the years to come. So please follow, please visit, please uh, look into the website of these companies, please follow all, all these exciting news and you will be also inspired in other parts of the world. So thank you so much, everyone.